Matthew chapter 12 is our text for this evening. If you're just joining us, let me give you a big uh, brief review. Um, We are going through the book of Matthew. These are the teachings of Jesus as recorded by one of his earliest followers, uh, a follower that was outside of the grace of God in the sense that he was living in a way that was not pleasing to the Lord. Uh, He was really defrauding his, his fellow countrymen as a tax collector. But God came to him and did an amazing work in his life, and he became a follower of him and began to record the ministry of Jesus, who was much more than a Jewish rabbi. He was indeed the Son of God. And so Matthew is writing this record of the life of Jesus so that other people who are like him, Jewish people who would not necessarily having believed in Jesus and having thought of him as anything maybe more than just an impressive religious teacher, would actually see him for who he is the Son of God, and be amazed by that reality. Well, we've been working our way through this book of Matthew, this writing of the book of Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 12, and what we found is that we've come into Matthew chapter 11 after the teachings of Jesus and the miracles of Jesus, we come to then the response to Jesus, and we've got all kinds of responses, just like we have today in society. Some people are like curious about Jesus. Some people are not at all interested in Jesus. Some people are want to follow Jesus uh, immediately and, and gladly. Other people are just sort of wanting instead to reject it altogether. One of the most common characters or groups of individuals that's described in the book of Matthew, as well as in Mark, Luke, and John, is a group called the Pharisees. They're a religious group. They kind of pride themselves as being people who know the Bible the best. They're trained well, supposedly. They seemingly are really trying to protect the Bible. And they're what's known as what we would refer to as legalists. They are people who really kind of pride themselves as keeping the law. We have people like that today. People like that who kind of pride themselves like they're not like these other people. They're not like other people in Miami. They've not done other things that people have done. And they think God is pleased with them because what they are, who they are, what they know, as opposed to being able to find the only way in which they can be forgiven of their sins and have faith with God is trust in Christ alone. Well, last week we started in Matthew chapter 12, specifically verse 22, to ask some questions. And I posed two questions to you. We continue that tonight. It's a conversation, and now just to review some of those questions. First of all, in verses 22 through 32, we talked about what does it take to convince you, and I mean you sitting there, what does it take to convince you that Jesus is God? What would it take? And in the text there, which we won't read the text for the sake of time, for the passage we went over last week, but what we saw here was that the Pharisees were self-deceived. A demon-oppressed man has now been healed, he can now speak, he can now see, and they don't believe. Why? because they have a problem that a lot of us can still have today, which is self-deception. This idea that I've already reached my conclusion and I don't want the facts to get in the way. As my father-in-law likes to say jokingly, don't confuse me with the facts. I already know what I want to believe. And so what we see here is that they were self-deceived. They had the proof, but they still denied the truth. We learned about blasphemy and blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and the unpardonable sin. The second question we looked at last week was, what do your words tell us about your heart? What do your words tell us about your heart? Here in Miami, when we have some of our older houses being remodeled, some of you can relate to this, houses are kind of being redone and we're not just having impact windows put in, they're kind of like hurricane proof. You'll sometimes find houses are having like giant kind of entryway windows, even the doorways. And it's kind of remarkable, right? You kind of like go from like total privacy, like total revelation. Like I know what the inside of your living room looks like and what you're doing in there. And I can almost see what you're eating because we have like just totally wide open doors and windows. You can see through people's houses and you're kind of like, wow, I guess we're just gonna like see what goes on in the house. It's kind of, it's kind of odd, right? I mean, some of our houses are like that here in Miami. It's like totally wide open. Well, that's, That's what happens with our mouth. That's what happens with what we say. Our mouth is a window into our heart. Stick around long enough and you can get to know any one of us by just listening to us speak. So what I said last week, it's like the core values of our life. We don't have to look for the brochure of what you believe. We can just listen to you and we'll find out what you really believe. 
So Jesus is talking about what do the words tell us? What do your words tell us about your heart? Those are our two questions from last week. Well, tonight, we come to the two other questions. Question number three is, are you still waiting on a sign from God? Are you still waiting on a sign from God? Grace Church here, we have a lot of singles here. And we just had in the month of January and Friday night, four consecutive Friday nights, a study uh, for singles on how to think through uh, dating and relationships and engagement and how to just think through that. And if you're not aware of that series, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and hear that. It's four consecutive Friday nights with teaching and then Q&A after every single night. Numbers of you were there. One of the things that we covered in that study was a lot of times guys, single guys who are interested in dating are wanting to find out kind of like a pre, kind of like survey, if I'm interested in this girl how do I know she's going to be interested in me so that before I ask her, I can kind of feel like it's going to be a confirmation of yes, an affirmative yes, so I'll put myself out there and look like a fool. And so we talked about the problem here is that the problem sometimes with guys is that they are not very courageous. They're worried about failure, which is already a problem in masculinity, and they do not communicate, and so they're kind of worried, and so it kind of begins like, kind of resorts back to like junior high tactics, right? You kind of like get a friend who knows a friend, and kind of like bring, if you could bring me up in the conversation, and just kind of see, do their eyebrows kind of go up? Do they kind of look to the left or to the right? Did they follow up with the sentence? I mean, I could just use any kind of indication that they think favorably of me. And if worse comes to worse, we can always like, you know, just text a few times and then see how quickly the reply comes back on the text, right? You're like, you're looking at it, like I sent a text and you're like, you're like waiting, you're waiting, you're counting the minutes. You're like, okay, what's the threshold? Is it five minutes? Is it 10 minutes? Is it 50? You're like, okay, five minutes. That seems like a sign. I think she's digging me. We want this sign, want this sign. We understand this way of thinking. All ways of how to make decisions, we're looking for signs that confirm what we should do. Well, moving from the silly to the serious, the Pharisees also thought this way, but very sinfully. Look at it with me, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, what happens here in verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, an an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. But just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Stop there for now. Are you still waiting on a sign from God? The Pharisees were. The Pharisees are saying, oh Jesus, we just need to see a sign from you. This initially seems like a reasonable request. But friends, understand, we've interrupted a larger scene, a larger conversation that's been taking place in their previous verses and our previous weeks. Friend, they have had an undeniable, overwhelming amount of signs. In fact, mind you, just earlier, if you can look back, as it says here, of what happens in Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, the demon-oppressed man was blind and mute and was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. In case it's left open to misinterpretation, the people got it, verse 23, and the people were amazed, except the Pharisees. Not enough for the Pharisees. Jesus, I have but one more request. I have but one more request for yet another sign from you. See, what they were interested in They were interested in trapping Jesus. 
They wanted to turn what he did as a way to write their own narrative of Jesus. They were already in the previous verses accusing his power to being satanic in its source. And Jesus says, you know what? We're done with the uh, show and tell. No more. No more. You don't lack for proof. You don't lack for clarity of revelation. You know. He says, except there actually will be one more sign. And then he says something radical. It's radical on several levels, and I don't want to make sure anybody in the room misses it. He says, except one more sign, and then look at what he says here in the text. No sign will be given to you, verse 39, at the very end of it, no sign will be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Verse 40, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of of the earth. What's he talking about? He's talking about his upcoming resurrection, which even his own disciples don't fully get. Now, the reason this is radical is because notice what Jesus does. He says, just as Jonah. Now, let's just um, take a minute here by way of implication for the Christians here to just realize how confident you can be when you read your Bible, when you have this Bible, and your friends are trying to tell you maybe on college campus or trying to tell you at work, whatever, like, dude, you don't, you don't like really believe all of this, do you? I mean, like, it's a little carried away. Like an old man, Abraham has a kid, and he's like, nine, I mean, come on. Right? Like Joshua, the son, said, so, okay, okay, I got one for you. Like, seriously, you don't actually think that this guy Jonah was like rebellious against God and he's on the boat tied in the opposite direction and sailors throw him over the boat and he's like, hey, God, I know I'm rebellious and then God sends a giant fish of some type, we're not quite sure what it is, and it swallows him up and somehow he's living, he's surviving in this thing for three days until he cries out to God and repents and then he spits him out and you're like, okay, that makes for cute stories and animation in VBS land but let's dial it back as the reality that really happened. It's, you know, it's just kind of a, a myth. It's just a bit of a, you know, just an exaggeration. It's kind of like sensationalized, like it makes for good TV, but it's not, obviously not true. Here's the problem with thinking that. Jesus believes it's true. Jesus actually says, no, what you, what you have, this is actually the word of God. In fact, Jesus' reference for the truthfulness of his resurrection to come is the truthfulness of what's already happened with Jonah. Now, for the Christians in the room, you gotta realize like, oh yeah, thank, thank you Jesus. I'm loving my Bible. It is inerrant. It is inspired. It is authoritative. It is sufficient. It is clear. I, Yes, I love this word of God. I, I love all of it. I will not apologize for any of it. And I realize it might stretch the imagination. It might be hard to explain. And it might be supernatural and how things are happening. But it happened. Now, for those perhaps struggling with whether or not they want to believe in Christ, Jesus says, if you're looking for a sign, there's one left to give you. is the resurrection. The question is not whether or not Jesus was crucified. The question is whether or not Jesus was resurrected. Did he literally, physically, come back from the dead or not? Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, listen, if this thing didn't happen, if it's just like a spiritual resurrection, he's like a, he's like a spiritual influence to us. He's just sort of like, he kind of like gives us victory over like the dark thoughts of our life. And he's just sort of like spiritually like, you know, but, but I mean like, don't get carried about his physical resurrection, but just spiritually, because that's what a lot of like liberal churches might say. Paul says, if that's how we think of resurrection, he says, listen, pack it up, go home. Like, what are you guys doing here? Go home. Don't, stop going to church. Our faith is in vain. But, if it did happen, the single greatest significant act in all of human history revolves around that resurrection. If it did happen, that's a game changer. That is a game changer. Because that means what this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, 
claimed to be, he was. He was not a liar. He was not a lunatic. He was the risen Lord. And here he is telling this crowd, a mixed audience like we have here tonight, a mixed crowd with some of his greatest critics saying, we just want another sign. He's like, you don't want another sign. You've gotten everything you need to know. But there's one thing left that you're going to see. Now, you would wish the rest of the story would be once he resurrected from the grave, all the Pharisees like collectively like fell down on their face and asked God to forgive them of the rebelliousness and please, Lord, forgive us. That's not what happened. That's not what happened. Now, here's what I want you to see because this is awesome stuff and you can maybe miss it, so let's see it together. In the text of what he's saying here because notice what he does next. Verse 40, just as Jonah, so the Son of Man will be. Now, here he goes into two examples. Verse 41, the men of Nineveh, it's referring to Jonah, because that's Jonah's ministry where he went to Nineveh and he preached to them and they repented. The queen of the south is referring to a text in 1 Kings about a queen who came up to see Solomon to really see with her own eyes. Was he really like as smart as everybody said he was? And he was. And she confirmed it. And he says, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment of this generation, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, something greater than Solomon's here. Here's what I want you to go back to. Go back to chapter 12, verse 6. The conversation is, Jesus is having a conversation about the Sabbath. Is it right for them to be like picking grain on the Sabbath? He's like, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. That's what he says in verse 8. But he makes a statement, verse 6. I tell you something. Something greater than the temple is here. Verse 41, something greater than Jonah is here. Verse 42, something greater than Solomon is here. Friends, you must not miss this. It would not have been missed by the Jewish readers when they were first reading this. And I want to make sure we don't miss it here today. Jesus is claiming to be greater than the temple, the prophet, the wise king Solomon. This is elevating his person, his proclamation, and his inauguration of his kingdom to be greater than, and therefore ultimately the fulfillment of everything Israel's history has been about. He is the fulfillment of the priest. He's greater than the temple. He is the fulfillment of the prophet. He's greater than Jonah. He is the fulfillment of the ultimate kingship of God. He is greater than Solomon, which would have been arguably thought as being the wisest king that has ever lived, who was given the responsibility, not David, Solomon, to build the temple. And Jesus is saying to this crowd in this northern town of Israel, someone greater is actually here. And they missed it. They missed it. The question is whether or not here, today, there's someone here that's missing it. This is why I prayed earlier that, that God would open your eyes to see the Savior to know who he is. And for the first time in your life to recognize the hope you can have in Christ. In no other name. We don't need another sign from God. We need to believe the historically documented, the biblically presented, and the personally illustrated signs of our own lives that have been transformed by the gospel. Question is, are you still waiting on a sign? Friend, there's no other sign to give you than what Christ has already offered you. Will you believe? That leads us to our fourth and final question. Do you want to fix yourself or have Jesus do it? Do you want to fix yourself or have Jesus do it? What happens here in this next text is he gets basically to a parable. And he's talking about this. Look at it with me. What he says in verse 43 of chapter 12. Jesus says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through the waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. When it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. 
Then it goes and brings it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. There is a huge industry today, a huge money-making industry today. And it, it's in publishing, it's on social media, it's in conferences. It's a huge industry on teaching people that they can fix their problems, they can accomplish their dreams, they can become the superheroes of their future if they'll turn inward, recognizing their capacity and live up to their full potential. Counsel like listening to success, to, to successful people will make you successful. Avoid negative thinking at all costs. Only good vibes here. Follow your heart. Your desire is destiny. Without wanting to malign the motives of people, I don't know individuals, I mean to speak to the ideas behind this counsel, it is garbage. Sorry. That was like offensive. Might be shocking. It's garbage. Here's what's worse than that. What's worse than that is when churches try to get in on this. Churches want to get on this. Like, you know what? You know what will make people want to come to church? Is that they can get that plus Jesus. So what they'll do is they'll take some like self-help stuff and they'll sprinkle some Bible verses on it. And now God is implicit in you fulfilling your greatest potential. He's like a supporting actor to being the best version of you. Oh man, this is such trash. This is a complete misrepresentation of the Bible, but so incredibly common. It, it's, it, it's a huge temptation to be man-centered versus God-centered. As if to say that you are just some depository of potential. And if you could just sort of unclick the secrets and unlock the doors and you can become all that you want to be. That is prison, not freedom. There's only freedom in Christ. But this is incredibly common. Huge conferences, lots of books, lots of social media tweets, tweets, uh, tweets and, and things that we send out. Like people love this stuff because it's, it's like cotton candy, man. We love it. Tastes so sweet. Like, yeah, yeah, tell me how awesome I am. Give it to me. What's happening here in the text and how does this relate to this? Nothing new. This section of scripture that I just read to you is relating to the same problem principally. See, here's what's going on. After this scene of judgment for rejecting Jesus as the Messiah and the inauguration of his kingdom, Jesus now is giving a parable here, a parable of this adulterous generation. And what he's talking about is this earlier incident. If you go back to verse 22, you don't have to go there and look at it now, but just earlier, 22 verse 37, was dealing with this demon-possessed man. So it was like a fresh thing that's like, hey, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that scene that took place that you guys apparently didn't like and you want another sign. Let's talk about that. And so Jesus returns to this topic of exorcism to make a final point. The Pharisees had accused Jesus of exorcising demons by Satan's power, but an ironic twist, a plot twist, Jesus shows that these religious leaders and those of the generation following these religious leaders were actually themselves under the influence of Satan's evil spirits. Jesus begins with this general statement about how demons operate. It's, it's a kind of a mind-bending, like, wow, that's, that's intense. This idea of demon exorcism, which speaks to the reality that this stuff is indeed real. And he talks about this idea of how they come out from a person. He speaks about what this means, this idea of coming out, is that he's come out through some type of exorcism, which would have been common at times in Jewish teachings. The evil generation that Jesus is addressing here has experienced Jesus' powerful ministry, especially through his exorcisms. This has been a really good thing for Israel. They've done amazing things now. But Israel has still not repented and turned to Christ as the Savior. He's done what none of them could do. But they've still not trusted Christ. Christ. 
Jesus is saying if this present generation doesn't, con- doesn't continues to reject Jesus, that they too will be like a repossessed demoniac. Their final condition of judgment will be worse than before, before Jesus ever even came to them. I mean, what he's saying here in the text is that he's telling the story to make a point that after the man was delivered, he tried by natural means to clean himself up. He thought he could improve his life. He could improve his condition. He had a problem. That problem is gone. And now he can fix himself. He can improve himself. He's like his own DIY project. Jesus is saying, just so you know where that leads you, that DIY mindset of your own spirituality, that'll lead you down a road that makes things worse than you were before. That's what Jesus is saying here. The condition will be worse. The Pharisees and these other religious leaders were in danger of that happening to them for their attempts at reformation without the power of God. They clearly did not understand God's power for they had just confused the power of the Spirit with the power of Satan. They were wide open targets for continued deception from Satan. Friends, let me ask you a question. What are you wanting from God? What do you really want? Do you want God to help you with some life-dominating sin that you want to get rid of? Do you want God to help address a loneliness issue that you've got in your life, which is a profoundly common problem here in Miami? Do you want God to kind of help maybe bridge some relational problems that you've got at home or some areas of wisdom that you need with maybe raising some kids? Is God a means to an end that after you seemingly get that, you're done with God? your heart will be harder for it. The opportunity here for us this evening is to realize only Jesus Christ delivers what our hearts long for. Peace, hope, forgiveness, confidence, encouragement, true satisfaction, identity, security. There is nothing that this world Nothing that your heart, nothing that anybody in your life can provide for you ultimately with complete satisfaction. No relationship, no possession. We, a number of us sat here earlier uh, today and uh, prayed before our service. You're welcome to come. It's at 4.30. And we prayed and we were praying before we did the prayer time. Uh, Ronald, one of our elders, was reading to us from uh, Thoughts for Young Men by J.C. Rowell about the pleasures of this world. And it was such a good reminder that the pleasures of this world will never satisfy. And if you need to be reminded of that, like you want just like a good book of like reality, you're like, you know, I'm ready to buckle up and sit down, like, oh, I'll give it to your mouth guard in, put your helmet on, like, okay, let's go, let's do this, let's do this. Read Ecclesiastes. It's in the Bible, it's in the Old Testament, it's right in the middle, kind of to the right of Psalms. Go to Ecclesiastes. But I'm telling you right now, you want to go to Ecclesiastes, like schedule like a happy movie after that. Just telling you right now, like, you know, get a friend, come over, like, plan a birthday party after that, because otherwise you're going to be, like, in a funk for, like, a couple of days. Because Ecclesiastes is actually written by Solomon, who Jesus is talking about, and he's actually saying, as as Solomon says, he's basically saying, hey, just so you know, I have done it all. I've owned it all. I've had sex with it all. I've possessed it all. I have done it. I mean, I literally have seen it all, done it all, know it all. I've taken it all, and it's nothing. And, and the reality is, think about you this, just, just to kind of real, remind you of just how insignificant life is and how much only Christ matters and why our life in Him will only be the one. Let me ask you this question. This is rhetorical, so don't do it because it'll be embarrassing. If you do. Think right now of your grandparents' name, okay? Think of your grandparents' name. Got, got the name? Grandmother, grandfather, some of you don't even know your grandparents. Think of your great grandparents' name. Okay, so now we're at, we're, at the, we're at the two greats. Grandparents, same great grandparents, we're at one great actually. I want you to think of the second great great grandparent. What is your great great grandparent's name? Most people in this room have no clue. No clue. That's your own family. That's your own family. What's my point? My point is if you're living to be known by men, 
when your own family doesn't even know your name after a couple generations? You're living for just a futile way of life. But to be living, to be known by Christ for all of eternity, where he knows you by name and your name is in the book of life, to be known by God, it says, that one is with me for all of eternity. Oh, friend, that for the first time is a life really worth living. That is a life that you can love. You can clap, golf clap, I'll take it. I'll take golf claps all day. We come back to our questions. What does it take to convince you that Jesus is God? What do, you, what do your words tell us about your heart? Are you still waiting on a sign from God? Do you want to fix yourself or have Jesus do it?